<laughs> Coming up on tonight's broadcast, ASOSU unable to make quorum, a shooting in Oklahoma, and a new report on smoking. All that and more right here on the Beaver News. Good evening and welcome to your Thursday night edition of the Beaver News. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Tyler Dahlgren. And I'm Brittany Mangold. Pre prepare for a construction on campus because the state legislator approved the capital construction bill, which includes bonds for the Student Experience Center and a new residence hall. The Daily Barometer reports, despite students in 2010 voting for fees to go towards construction of the SEC building, the state legislator had concerns for the amount of debt the state was taking on and did not approve the bill. Two years of waiting paid off for Oregon State University, and now students can look forward to new additions on campus, as well as renovation to the Memorial Union. The Student Experience Center will be the home to student activities such as student media and the student government. In addition to the SEC building, a much needed new residence hall will be built to accommodate the growing number of students enrolling at at OSU. This addition will hopefully relieve some pressure off of the city with a near 0% zero, zero vacancy rate for rental properties. Last night's joint session of the Associated Students of Oregon State University House and Senate voted on four budgets before ending the meeting due to lack of quorum. The required quorum is at least 12 out of 22 current representatives in order to conduct business. Only 11 representatives were present last night and several of that 11 were stand-in replacements. Speaker of the House Drew Hatlin attributes the lack of attendance due, the, due to the pressures of being a student triumphing being a representative. Of the budgets voted on last night, all were passed except for the Educational Activities budget. The Educational Activities serves a variety of activities and clubs for students, including student media. The joint session will meet again next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Corvallis native and internationally famous jazz singer Hallie Lauren will perform with the Corvallis OSU Symphony Orchestra tomorrow night. Don Eiler of the Daily Barometer reports, the concert is a special benefit for the Corvallis OSU Symphony Society Student Musician Scholarship Fund, which helps student musicians here at Oregon State University. Lauren will also be celebrating the American release of her latest album, Heart First, a number one hit on the Japanese jazz charts. Lauren will perform some material from her new album, which has a mix of musical influ uh, influences from jazz, classical rock, and Bob Marley. The performance tomorrow night is at 8 p.m. at LaSalle Stewart Center. Tickets start at $22 and will be available for half price for OSU students. We now go to Hayden Wilcox with a report from last week's ASOSU presidential address. Hayden? The president of the ASOSU, M. Tonga Hapoi. On Thursday night, I was given the opportunity to go to the ASOSU State of the Student Address hosted by President M. Tonga Hapoi. Thank you all for being here tonight. So I am here with President M. Tonga Hapoi. Uh, Ms. President, tell us about uh, how tonight's meeting went. Uh, what do you feel uh, was good about tonight's meeting? Um, from tonight's meeting, what I really appreciated was um, the comments made from the Ways and Means Chair about moving forward, as well as uh, many comments going around from the Speaker of the House, Drew Hatlin, and then President of the Senate, and also Vice President Soko Eth, just making sure that everyone understands where we are in the current climate for ASOSU. From the meeting last night with many leaders in this room, I can see that we all agree it's time to be in a positive mood, put the campus onto a better light. There is much work to be done. Many people just still have the peace and a puzzle to share. And I'm thankful for the collaboration that we've had from the leaders, Speaker Drew Hatlin, Vice President and President of the Senate, Soko Eth, as well as the Ethics and Oversight Chair, Musa Diabat. Moving ASOSU forward is the only place we should be looking. And I wish you all to join us in that journey, as difficult as it may be for some. We are all going to be here until the end. And what, hope, uh, what changes do you hope to see in the next term? Um, changes I'd like to see would just be 
I think more support from the campus onto um, the work that ASOSU has done and to get involved because most likely everyone has an opinion, everyone wants to change something. And as you saw tonight from, I think our four hour joint session, this is the place to be because changes do get made. And we had administrators in the room the whole night. The Dean of Student Life was here the whole entire night listening into what we needed and to what changes to happen on campus. So get involved. Members of the community were asked to give their input on how they can make ASOSU a better program. But above all, as the president said, the best thing that students can do to improve ASOSU is to get involved. This has been Hayden Wilcox. Back to you in the studio. Research suggests that overreacting to a child's behavior may not be the best way to handle the situation, reports Amanda Antell of the Daily Barometer. Parenting can be a difficult task, and when you add in the stress of school, work, and life in general, it is easy to see how parents can overreact during a child's tantrum. Recent studies show that when a frustrated parent yells at a child, the child tends to yell back louder and can lead to worse temper tantrums by having a negative impact on their self-esteem and behavioral development. Joanne Sorte, director of Oregon State University Child Development Laboratory, suggests that the overreactions can occur because of lack of knowledge and awareness on the parent's part of what, child's, of what children are developmentally capable of. Yelling at a child becomes a negative model in their life and may lead them to believe the way to handle problems in life is to yell. Sorte and the study suggest parents remain firm and consistent with children to set a positive example. We now go to Cody Lawrence for his weekly questions in the quad segment. Cody. I'm Cody Lawrence, and this is Questions in the Quad. Today's question, what is your dream job and why? I'm here with Shay in the Quad. Shay, if you could do any job, what would you do and why? I would like to be a pathologist and work in a lab. Um, I like working indoors. I, I love outside, but I would love to work indoors, and I like looking at interesting slides and uh, looking, helping people with cancer and things. So. Sounds like a noble career. Thank you for your time. I'm here with Jeremy. Jeremy, what is your dream job and why would you do that? Uh, skating or surfing. That sounds like a pretty fun job. Would you uh, want to go any place if you could surf? Like any place in particular? Um, I would try out like uh, Australia or Mexico. Sounds like a good place to visit. Thank you for your time. I'm here in the quad with Cole and Chase. If you guys could have any job, any dream job, what would you do and why? Thanks, Cody. In an experiment using snakes, scientists at Oregon State University have verified the link between hormones and pheromones. As reported by McKinley Smith of the Daily Barometer, OSU scientists were questioning what the physiological cue or trigger is for the body to produce pheromones. Robert Mason, zoologist and chairman of the biology program at OSU, explains, as snakes move, they secrete lipids that contain pheromones, which are odor cues, that other snakes sense by flicking their tongues. Snakes use pheromones to detect the sex of other snakes and initiate procreation. Robert Mason and his team wondered if male snakes treated with estrogen would produce the same pheromones as female snakes, and would male production of female pheromones attract male snakes? Scientists used, uh, used an implant to deliver estrogen to male snakes over winter break before mating season. After males receive the dose of estrogen, they are placed with other males and female snakes. Mason claims the results were dramatic, quote, it turns out we made these males smell like very large females. They were more attractive than the small male or females, end quote. According to Mason, the estrogen hormone only activated female characteristics. It did not change the males into females, and the male snakes who received estrogen were back to normal the following season. We're heading into our first short break, but don't go anywhere because when we return, we have 
weather update and a look at the news around the nation. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Beaver News right here on KBVR. Tonight, three people remain hospitalized after shots were fired outside of an Oklahoma courthouse yesterday afternoon, as reported by CNN. 23-year-old Andrew Joseph Dennehy waved his gun at deputies before discharging the gun, witnesses say. A bystander was also shot and wounded during the incident. A deputy who was shot suffered serious wounds to his hands, although they are not considered life-threatening. A woman is listed in fair condition, and a fourth person was treated, was treated for and released for emotional distress. It is unclear at this point what Dennehy's motives or intentions were. However, an investigation continues. Award-winning director James Cameron aims to dominate something other than the box office sales. CNN reports Cameron is hoping to reach Mariana Trench, the deepest known point in the world's ocean, located near Guam in the Western Pacific. Mariana Trench is deeper than Mount Everest is tall, totaling around 35,800 feet deep, a depth only two people have gone before. Built in Australia, Cameron's high-tech single pilot submersible, the Deep Sea Challenger, was constructed by Cameron and his team of scientists and engineers over the past eight years. The Deep Sea Challenger is outfitted with special cameras and robotic arms and is able to dive vertically at speeds of 500 to 700 feet per minute and can withstand immense pressure up to 16,000 pounds per square inch. This is not the first adventure for Cameron, who has been a, li a lifetime uh, explorer of the sea. His interest in the sea also influenced the making of his two highest grossing movies, Titanic and Avatar. During the creation of Avatar, Cameron sought inspiration by diving to explore the ship's sunken remains, and his creatures on the planet Pandora in Avatar were inspired by real-life sea creatures seen during the diving ventures. We now go to Courtney Becker to see if the nice weather we had today is going to be sticking around through the weekend. Good evening, Corvallis. I'm Courtney Becker, and here's your five-day forecast. This evening, expect a low of 34 degrees. Tomorrow, we have some more sun, with a high of 61 degrees during the day and a low of 43 degrees at night. Unfortunately, though, this weekend, we're back to some rain, with a high of 52 degrees during the day and a low of 39 degrees at night on Saturday. On Sunday, expect rain again with a high of 45 degrees during the day and a low of 36 degrees during the evening. And finally on Monday, back to more rain again with a high of 45 degrees during the day and a low of 34 degrees at night. And that's your five day forecast. Back to you in the studio. A Texas, a Texas teenager is lucky to, be lucky to be alive having escaped from an alleged predator in a motel, according to CNN. The 13-year-old met the man on Facebook after, after he befriended her, posing as a 15-year-old boy. She agreed to meet him at a motel, having her older sister drive her. When she arrived, she says an, old, she says an older man met her at the door and told her that her friend was in the shower and, and would be out soon. When she turned her back to him, he allegedly grabbed her and put tape around her mouth. She says she revisited and screamed, which caused the man to panic and remove the tape. She was then able to run out to her sister, who was waiting in the parking lot. Most situations do not end so safely, so if you plan to meet someone in person that you only know online, be sure to do so in a public place. A new report released by the U.S. Surgeon General shows that each day over 3,800 people under 18 years of age smoke their first cigarette and over 1,000 people under the age of 18 become daily smokers. This report describes how some tobacco companies actually advertise their advertising practices are directed at younger people. For example, they say the companies are strategically locating tobacco-related marketing materials where young children will be exposed to them in convenience stores. The role of menthol cigarettes and their appeal to younger smokers is also discussed in the Surgeon General's report. The report claims tobacco companies have long known of menthol's ability to mask harshness associated with cigarette smoke, increase the ease of smoking, and provide a cooling sensation that appeals to many smokers, particularly new smokers. CNN reports that in 2009, Congress granted the FDA authority to regulate tobacco products, which, which the FDA has only banned flavored cigarettes and no other flavored tobacco product. Altria, the parent company of Philip Morris USA, the largest tobacco company in the United States, made a statement after the release of the Surgeon General's report insisting their company and the federal government who regulates them are working together for the same cause, 
which is to make sure kids can't access tobacco products. As of fall term 2012, smoking will be prohibited on the OSU campus, a decision that was passed by students. Most people, most people believe money can solve most of their problems, but that is not the case for one Michigan woman. Amanda Clayton was an unemployed woman struggling to pay her bills and relying on $200 a month in state food assistance to help her get by. Then her luck changed and she won $1 million in the state's Make Me Rich lottery game show. Clayton chose to take a lump sum of money, which she says ended up being just over $500,000, which she used to buy a car and a house. After winning the lottery, Clayton continued to collect the $200 a month benefits. She assumed they, she assumed they would have been cut due to, the, due to her winnings, but since they weren't, she continued to use them. And when she asked, stated she felt she believed she still deserved them, saying, quote, I kind of do. I have no income, and I have to pay bills. I have two houses, end quote. While there are currently no checks and balance systems in place to verify a client's income, lawmakers are hard at work to change that. They are currently working on a system that would cross-check lottery winners with state benefit recipients to eliminate taxpayers from supporting lottery winners. It's now time for a final break of the evening. But we will it's now time for a final break of the evening, but quick break, so welcome back. Mm -hmm. CNN reports radiation from two massive solar flares emitted from the sun on Tuesday began hitting Earth's atmosphere this morning. The flares, which are associated with an event called coronal mass ejection, bring a strong geomagnetic storm to Earth, which can cause problems to power grids and low-frequency radio communications. At the same time, geomagnetic storms are responsible for beautiful auroras that may be visible as far south as Oregon and Illinois as the geomagnetic storms intensity increases. The effects of, a, of this wave of solar radiation are expected to linger into early Friday morning, but the sunspot that produced these effects is still facing directly at Earth, and further emissions could bring new waves of radiation. One of Tuesday's two coronal mass ejections were the strongest observed in more than five years, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A video entitled Stop Coney went viral yesterday, putting the spotlight on Ugandan warlord Joseph Coney. The half-hour documentary made its, made its rounds, being reposted several million times on social networks such as Facebook. The film was produced by San Diego nonprofit group Invisible Children, whose goal is to make Joseph Coney a household name. Coney is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, which is notorious for abduction, raping, and maiming their victims, as well as recruiting child soldiers. The LRA wants, the overth wants to overthrow the Ugandan government. In response to the viral video, some are urging caution against the Invisible Children, saying that they have manipulated facts in the past. Spokeswoman for Invisible Children, Noelle Jouglé, replied to the allegations by saying the group has had to simplify events and information in the documentary so that their target audience could understand and pay attention. If you are interested in viewing the video titled Stop Coney, it is readily available online. International powers that agreed to resume nuclear talks with Tehran reaffirmed their support for a diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear issue. CNN reports Germany and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, China, France, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States released a statement declaring their overall goal is a long-term solution to restore international confidence in Iran's nuclear program. Israel, the United States, and other countries have long said they suspect Iran is trying to build nuclear weapons, and the international inspectors have voiced concern about the possibility. Iran has insisted that its nuclear program is for peaceful, peaceful purposes. Iran confirmed this year that it began the enrichment of uranium as its underground Fordow facility, and reports emerged last month that new advanced centrifuges were being used at Natanz. The International Atomic Energy Agency suspects that research on triggers for nuclear weapons is being carried out at the site. After negotiations, Iran of uh, offered officials from the IAEA to inspect the site after a meeting in Washington, D.C. between President Barack Obama and their Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to stand together to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon.
After the Oregon State men's basketball team defeated Washington State 69-64 in the opening game of the Pacific Life Pac-12 Conference Tournament yesterday, yesterday afternoon, they faced off against the number one seeded University of Washington Huskies, a team that they had lost to twice in the regular season and were able to win in nail-biting fashion 86-84. Devon Collier again led the team with 19 points after having a standout game yesterday against the Cougars, while Jared Cunningham and Joe Burton tied, tied for most rebounds with 10 each against Washington. Oregon State will now play again tomorrow at 6-10 against the number four seed University of Arizona. Unfortunately, women's basketball came to an end yesterday when the Beavers dropped the opening game of the, of the Pac-12 tournament, losing to the Washington State Cougars 65-56. The Beavers got off to a rough start, hitting just four of their first 17 shots en route to a 17-2 first quarter deficit. They were able to shake off their slow start, going on a 12-5 run that narrowed the Beaver deficit to just five points, down 22-17. The Cougars scored the game's next six points, but the Beavers rallied again, going on a 10-4 run at the end of the first half, cutting the Cougar lead to just five points, 32-27. The loss makes the Beavers 5-11 at the conference tournament over the past decade, never advancing past the second round. Oregon State will return home and await possible postseason play, announced on Monday. Oregon State Wrestling will send eight wrestlers to the NCAA Championships, taking place March 15th through the 17th in St. Louis, Missouri. Senior Garrett Drucker received an at-large berth Wednesday when the NCAA announced the entire 330 wrestling field. Additionally, Clayton Jack and Mike Mangrum picked up seeds at their respective weight classes. Jack is the number three seed in the heavyweight class, and Mangrum is the number four at the 141 pounds. It's the second straight year in which the Beavers will send eight wrestlers to nationals. Last year's team placed 21st, Oregon State's highest finish since the 2001 season when they finished 18th. This has been a look at Pac-12 Sports. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Be sure to tune in Monday at 7 p.m. for more of your local, national, and international coverage right here on the Beaver News. Have a great night, everyone.